Welcome to Garfield. This is Will Sanchez. My very special guest today is Gary Corbett. He is a man on a mission, a mission to save running's historic legacy. Indeed, I first met Gary last year at 228th Street and Broadway doing a ceremony where we were honoring his late father, Ted Corbett, on a street signing. I'm thrilled to have Gary as a guest. Well, it's good to be here, and I applaud you for all you're doing for preserving a history of the sport with all the interviews you've done so far. Well, thank you. That's an honor coming from you. I've done over 100. I hope to get close to 500 before my successor follows me. Well, the, some of the elders of the sport will work together to get them here in the studio. Oh, excellent, excellent, yeah. excellent. But Gary, before we go into your mission, your quest to preserve running's uh, legacy, let's learn about it. you first. Tell us where you were born, a little bit about your childhood. Okay, well, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, we uh, moved, born in 1951, we moved to the Bronx. 225th Street and Broadway and 228th Street and, and uh, Ted Corbett Way now and Marble Hill Projects in 1955. So I grew up, went to Dewey Clinton High School and uh, so Bronx was uh, my upbringing. Excellent. As a child, were you very actively running around the Bronx? Oh yeah, well we, uh, you know, we were always outside playing and uh, Projects was a beautiful place to grow up. It was a, Marble Hill community was beautiful. It was an integrated community. We were always playing uh, uh, softball, stickball, uh, Johnny on the Pony, uh, Ring Alivio, and we would have a lot of races around the projects and uh, uh, sprint races and race, longer races, and so always, oh, always active, always outside. Where did you go to college? Went to Howard University. Do sports there at Howard? I didn't do sports uh, there. I uh, ran track in uh, junior high school and high school. Were you a long distance guy too? I uh, didn't, didn't take up long distance run until I moved to Jacksonville. Uh, and that was, uh, we moved in uh, 1979 and took up distance running in 1980. 1980. Uh, I'd, I'd done some, but nothing uh, consistent. Okay. Now, growing up, your father is, is, is Ted Corbett, and most people know he's a legend. He. Uh, he was a pioneer in so many different ways. Are we only going to scratch the surface today, you know, as we know? Yeah. I mean, uh, he was a pioneer in physical therapy, and then yeah. uh, he started long distance running. When did he become aware that uh, he was different? I embraced everything that was going on in our household. It was a part of our life, my mother too, where we just, uh, you know, we'd go to the races, we would, uh, uh, my father, when the New York Roadrunners Club started, uh, uh, he was the editor of the publication, New York Roadrunners Club newsletter, and we printed the newsletter on a kitchen table. So it was a family so, it, Very much, affair. very much. And I, I, uh, he printed, I would uh, distribute them at races, the major races, uh, and if a runner wasn't at a race, then my mother would send it out to to the ones that weren't there. You know, races were a, a big size race was maybe 35 runners back back in, the, in that day. And, uh, and this was, was in the 50s? This was in the uh, 50s and early 60s. So a race like the Cherry Tree Marathon, which was the first uh, uh, New York Marathon, I could reach most of the members at that race or the nine mile cross country race in the fall. One thing was a race called the Burwick Marathon in um, Pennsylvania on Thanksgiving Day. And uh, we would have our, uh, Turkey on Friday. So that, that was an example of a, maybe a, a real act, we were a realized we're working a little different, but it just was part of our life. It didn't, didn't really feel different, okay. especially early on. Okay. He was a pioneer in physical therapy. I mean, everybody today is a physical therapist, but in those days that was probably unheard of. And he, what were some of the things that he came up with that were different? What he did was he would travel the world and study from the uh, inventors of approaches. And so he was the first generation individuals teaching these different disciplines. Uh, progressive uh, resistance exercise was, was one of his big areas. Uh, and he was one of the first people to endorse weight training for athletes. Uh, back in the uh, 50s, it was uh, uh, not uh, welcomed or uh, encouraged. And even some of the coach, famous coaches in the uh, early 60s didn't, didn't think much of weight training. He was always uh, into that. You know, we used to get the Iron Building magazine that would come in the mail all the uh -huh. time. And he was an early uh, learner, and then he taught 
what he what he what he what he learned and any any practice so it, it was really uh sometimes i can i can make an argument that his his physical therapy work was even more significant in his running uh, because he was he was a, a a teacher and and a healer one of the first to embrace biomechanics when you talk to people in the field uh, they say he was, he was ahead of his time yeah, he was definitely he said he got to travel the world is that to to his job where was he working that gave him that kind of cachet yeah he was uh, working at the uh, institute for the Disabled, International Center for the Disabled. Uh, back then it was called the Institute for Crippled and Disabled, but that's that's what it was called. Uh, they were formed in, back in 1920. They were world-renowned. Uh, Where's it located? Uh, 23rd Street and 1st Avenue. Interesting. Yeah. I even heard that they, at, in the early years, people didn't even have to pay for their uh, 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 services. Yeah, so it's a, a story in itself. And he, he ran from home, which he said was 228th Street, to work. And he didn't go a direct route. He worked south of where we lived. He, he ran north up in the Yonkers and then worked his way downtown. The scenic route, huh? 20 miles. That was his, that was his signature workout. Why, why did he do that? Why, nobody else was doing that. Why did he think of doing that? He was an athlete first and trying to see how far he could go with his uh, uh, training and to improve his performance. So it was really about experimenting with the mega distances. Now, he, he had four weeks where he went over 300 miles in training. A week? Uh, with, a week, which sets 44 miles a day. Yeah. Uh, he had a month or two where he did 1,000 miles in a month. So he pushed the envelope. I mean, and he would, and, 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 and one lesson from that is that he did overdo it. He did uh, overdo it. He did overdo it. He admitted it. that at some yeah. point. There is a point of diminishing returns. Yeah. But he didn't know he at that time. He to find it. And he wanted to see. He really was pushing it. It might be different from other person, but he certainly showed that uh, the human body was tremendously capable. That's an important lesson. The body, with consistent training, adapts and, and progressively gets stronger and stronger. Uh, it can take on more load and it can take on a faster uh, pace. Uh, so it's uh, you got to find that balance. He went too far in terms of the mileage, yeah, and not uh, being rested enough in key races. Okay, so one of the uh, one of the things they tell runners today is rest is an extremely important component of training. I'll give you one uh, streak. Uh, he ran for 13 years, twice a day workouts for 13 years, <laughs> and and the only reason he, that stopped was he got attacked by a dog on a workout, a second workout one day, and. Uh, a few miles away from home, and that, that it wiped him out for about a month. That is a, a tremendous longevity. Uh, unheard of even in nowadays. I mean, there are a lot of crazy um, maniacs that do things, but uh, that one really is uh, tremendous. And it's all documented. But he kept meticulous records of, every, of all his running. Was there a purpose? For, he, I guess you said he was, uh, he was uh, learning, so I guess he wanted a, a historical yeah. tracking of what he was doing. Well, di you know, diaries are good to keep in general with, with any kind of work that you're doing, in exercise, particularly exercise and training. So he, he you know, kept all his workouts uh, you know, in, in diary format, and I, I have them going back. I even have some things going back into the 30s. Uh, but I've consi consistently, year by year, after 1949, throughout his throughout his running career. Where are they housed now? Uh, pretty much most everything's in Jackson Protected. now. Protected. Protected. Well, and, 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 obviously and, you want to digitize that whole thing at some point. Well, that's part of this uh, mission with the history preservation. Oh, right. You have to, you have to digitize. Uh, that uh, go to dust. Yeah. yeah okay. pa All right. Paper's fragile. Everything's fragile. That is tremendous. Now. Internationally, I think he'd done races as well. I think he did comrades a few times. Well, he didn't do comrades because of apartheid. Oh. Uh, so he, he would have, it was not it was an opportunity. Okay, uh, so he ran it, into it, discrimination, even though, it, well, I guess the 50s and 60s, not that long ago, but there was. Yeah. He, he ran a London and Brighton 52-mile uh, uh, race five times in the 1960s, and that was that was the de facto uh, World Ultramarathon Championship because the comrades had, you know, because he couldn't compete there. Okay. Uh, and he took uh, second there three times at London okay. and Brighton. Okay. Any other international? Uh, he, he also ran uh, American records three times internationally on the track at 50 miles, 100 miles, and 24 hours. Tremendously. You know. 
Uh, is there any story where he ran a race where, because of his color, he was denied recognition or anything like that happened to him? The, the, the big issue was in college. There were times where uh, the, t the team, uh, University of Cincinnati, is where he went and competed, and the uh, uh, teams would not race. Uh, so they, they, that hindered their schedule in that way. Interesting. And uh, after college, he, he shied away from traveling, not knowing what to expect uh, in places. So he could have, uh, there were things he could have done after college, track-wise and running-wise, uh, that he didn't because of the climate. Okay. His team was denied. That's back in the in late thirties. Late thirties. Late thirties. Late thirties. thirties and early forties. So this is after the depression. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How sad that is. Yesterday, you came in front of Roadrunners to do a presentation. Yes. I guess this comes to that project you're working on. You know, first tell us what that project is and how. Did it come about that you were able to take it on? My father didn't throw anything away. And uh, so he left all these treasures. He also left a lot of junk, too, things that should have been thrown out years ago. As we talked earlier, my, uh, my background profession is in research, market research. Uh, so I'm, I'm organized, I'm detailed. I have a discipline where I can spend 10, 15 hours going through things and, you know, with a purpose. And, uh, and that's what I've been doing since his passing. And I'm, I'm still not all the way done. I'm, this is uh, what, when did he pass? Uh, 2007. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm about 80, 80 to 90 percent done with organizing all his papers and his collection. It's, it's tremendous. So he left, he left a lot. And uh, I grew up around the sport. I saw the sport grow. Uh, it was like a big family, and that was part of you know, my presentation yesterday, too, to talk about the history of New York Roadrunners, uh, the real history of the New York Roadrunners, and we, we talked a little bit about that also. I've been challenged in the sport since 2010 to make running history preservation a priority. There are things happening that are good, but there's not a nationally kind of coordinated effort to uh, make it easy when, when uh, a person passes that collections and estates could be passed on. The to family has to know. Sometimes the family yeah. doesn't even know. Do not know, and it, and it could easily be thrown away. Uh, you know, it's history is sure very it's fragile. Happened, yeah. you know, it's happened a lot. I put together in August a uh, document, the state of running history preservation in the United States, as a, one more effort to try to encourage the running community to take this on. And it's, uh, I'm proud of what, what, I, what I was able to put together because it, 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 it looks at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats within this issue. It also lists who has collections now. I mean, that's one of the, the, th the threats here is that we don't know who has the collections. Uh, we have to at least know that so that we can have an alliance with the family. So at the proper time it can be passed on and preserved. And then what we want to do is uh, preserve uh, these legacies. See, by my growing up around the sport, I was in a unique position to see this, and not only that I want to preserve my father's legacy, but I want to preserve the legacy of all the pioneers, founding fathers of the sport, and there's a lot of them. And they'll be forgotten if yes. someone doesn't raise their names up. That's right. What are some of the places that have collections? Well, the Armory here is doing a good job. Jack Pfeiffer has uh, uh, started a library, and their focus is track, particularly indoor track, Madison Square Garden. It was a time where there were five indoor meets here, that, and they all would be uh, filled, the garden would be filled. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that history, there's the history at the Armory itself. Uh, the RRCA is doing a good job because they've uh, digitized all the long distance logs. Browning Ross in 1956 started a publication called the Long Distance Log, which was the home for race results nationally and communication nationally for the sport. That whole collection is uh, digitized on the RRCA uh, history website. They've also done an oral history project of the women pioneers of the sport. And this is tremendous because virtually all the women are still alive. And they've... Uh, they weren't allowed to run until very recently. Well, that's... Title uh, IX. Yeah, and that's, yes. So they, they've, the RRCA has done a very good job. And in the coming years, they're going to put all those interviews uh, online. In the 1950s, the longest distance women could run was 220 yards. That's right, that's right. And it's a slow progress in those years. And now look at how, how women are dominating oh, they, the sport with, with the numbers. Nothing can stop them. They can run as well as the men. Yeah. In fact, sometimes even better. Yeah. The longer the distance, the better they do. Yeah. I'm highly motivated to do this, so that's why it's a, it's a labor of love. 
uh, and honor both my parents uh, and their, their spirit, you know, guides me forward. It's just a lot of work. Uh, uh, fortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm retired. I'm over four years retired now, so I, I can put the time into it. What kind of help would be really beneficial to really get this to the next level? We have to get a group of people that are committed on, on this. I think, I think a, a, a probably a nonprofit uh, corporation needs to be started. My vision would be that both long distance running and track and field uh, history would be worked on together. Uh, that, now, the, the sports are different, the audiences are different, so that's that's a little tough one there in itself. But my interest is in both. I need people to really contact me, and we need to build leaders. I, I can't do this myself, and a few people can't do this. My, and one of my recommendations, the document has 18 recommendations, and one of them says that we form a, a, a committee of 12 to 15 committed people. And it really has to be committed, uh, you know, not something that, you know, after a year or so, it dies out. It's a lifetime commitment. It really, really where, where can folks find this document? They can contact me uh, at uh, CorbettG at Comcast.net uh, or on, uh, on Facebook, uh, uh, connect with me, Tech Corbett Pioneer. Okay. Uh, so those are, those are ways. I would think that a university would take this on. The way they take on women's studies, you know, black studies, gay studies. Yeah. I think we need a sports history studies program. Yep. They would be ideal to, and then have a, like you said, a corporate sponsor like ESPN, uh, ABC, they do the Olympics, and they have, you know, stockpiles of stuff. I think the university is a perfect place. Uh, I have regional repositories that co collect and curate uh, collections. and. Uh, I think that's that's the future, and uh, we just need to find the people that can start championing this Champion. around the okay, country. So before you get to the university, your, your vision, that's got a committee of 15 committed people. You put together a plan, and one of those is get these regional universities, put out the word if if a family member that was a good runner or has doesn't have to be a good runner has kept good records of running, you, you know, you want to preserve that and collect that. And that's one of the strengths of the running community is that people have done that very well. And uh, so there's a lot of that out there, but we just need to... The good records. Uh, yes. And we have to have a, you know, a place for, the, for these. You know, it, it's a matter of uh, just uh, connecting with families in a timely manner and, uh, and making it easy on families uh, uh, to capture, capture this history. Yeah, yeah. Capture these stories. Tell us a little bit more about uh, the history of the sport. The people should understand uh, that uh, a club called the New York Pioneer Club, um, this is a tremendous story that's virtually un been untold uh, in, uh, in, in, in the kind of ways, documentary or in-depth book ways that it should be. But it was started in 1936 by three black gentlemen in Harlem. Uh, uh, Mr. Joseph Yancey was the uh, longtime coach and, and co-founder, and this was an integrated track team, road running team, also with race walkers and, uh, and ultra marathoners. Uh, probably one of the most unique team in, in the world in the 1950s. Unheard of, yes. But this was an integrated team predating uh, the integration of uh, all the professional sports. In 1942, they changed the Constitution that opened it up for, to everybody. Uh, it was a home for a lot of Jewish athletes. What Mr. Yancey was doing through sports, building men of character, because he was very big on that, he was making civil rights history. Now, in 1958, 1959, when the New York Roadrunners Club was formed, uh, it would not have started in that point in time without the New York Pioneer Club. My father and John Sterner were, were called the co-founders of the club, both New York Pioneer Club members. Uh, nearly half of the members, the first, one of the early rosters of members, 47 members, were New York Pioneer Club mm -hmm. members. Of the 10 presidents over the history of the club, four have been New York Pioneer Club members. And your father was the first. My father was the first. A lot of times, though, the history of the club starts with my father and then go, jumps to Fred LeBeau. Uh, there were six presidents before Fred came to see him. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, but Fred LeBeau, of course, put them on a map when he, when he uh, pioneered or helped to pioneer the Five Borough Marathon. He did, uh, but prior to Fred, the structure of the sport, the, the foundation, the governance, 
the building of women to the sport, the movement to Central Park uh, for races, and all the uh, diverse governance issues, age group competitions, all these things happened under the watch of a lot of presidents prior to, prior to Fred. That, you know, again, I, I knew these, these gentlemen as, as I was a child, and now I'm, I'm learning more about them as I research, go mm -hmm. back and research mm -hmm. the sport. And uh, I, I, I want to do all I can that their work is never forgotten. Interesting. They should do a movie about the Roadrunner's history. I mean, they've done movies about Fred LeBeau, they've done movies about individual athletes, a movies coming out on Jesse Owens, mm -hmm. but uh, there seems to be uh, lots of good stories uh, yet to be told. There is, and the New York Pioneer Club is one of those, you know, it's the Pioneer Club is a, it's dormant now. It would be good to get an, a, have an alumni, active alumni. I have a, what I've called New York Pioneer Club history project, so I've, I've got email uh, and addresses of people, and I'm in touch with, the fam with family members of uh, Mr. Yancey and Ed Levy. Uh, it's one of those stories that needs to be, uh, yeah, interesting. be told. I mean, there's, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of running clubs uh, in New York City. You know, the Harriers, there's a relatively new one, Harlem Run, okay. started by a young woman. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, black Women Run. Right. You mm -hmm. know, there's these tremendous clubs. Right. And I wonder if they know their history of running. But I can tell you this, we all are fascinated by, by the legends, by yeah. when we hear learn first about that corporate, you know, with your drop. Well, and when that uh, signing ceremony that, that you had last year, a club ran 10 miles from uh, Nike Town right, I remember, to, I, to show I, up, you yeah, know. I remember they heard and about they, that, yeah. You yeah. Know, they were so excited. You know, a lot of times people, you know, they, there's a perception, obviously, that people don't care about history, and uh, I hope that's not true. I don't think it's true. I don't think it's true. And we, and, and uh, I think we just got to make package it in such a way, and uh, get it in front of people. Well, I think it's very doable. I mean, the people that that do well from running are very, very well off, and I think they'd be interested in mm -hmm. preserving their own legacies, mm -hmm. like the ESPNs and the networks, mm -hmm. and uh, and, the, and the corporations like Nike. I mean. They would probably love to make a contribution if somebody stepped up with a coherent plan. There it is. Plan. All right. Have a plan, yeah. That's All right. Well, good luck on that again. Okay. <laughs> Pamela Cooper in her book, American Marathon, states it well that the, because the, 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 the other thing about the Pioneer Club was it was open to all athletes of all abilities. You didn't have to be a star or champion. Joe welcomed everybody. And that's what the mass marathon culture is today. Yeah. Um, and so, in her book, she states that, uh, that uh, Mr. Yancey led the way with the, what the Pioneer Club was offering to uh, what we have today with the mass marathon. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and running is uh, it's a transformative uh, sport, and other people figured out to use it for other good causes. Mm -hmm. You probably heard about the organization Back of My Feet. This is a running-based program that is going to help you change your life in the way that you want to. This is an organization started by a young woman in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. She was running and saw these homeless people outside mm -hmm. cheering her on, and they reminded her of her dad because her dad suffered through uh, depression. Mm -hmm. And she was thinking, wow, I'm here enjoying myself. Why don't I invite these guys? Well, to make a long story short, she started this movement, Back of My Feet, getting people that are experiencing homelessness to better their lives by giving them a goal. Mm -hmm. And so they have chapters now in dozens of cities mm -hmm. using this transformative power of running. Running is such a rich, mm -hmm. diverse, never-ending uh, thing. It's a beautiful thing. The sport has changed for the good to bring more people into it uh, over the years, and it's, it's so different now. I mean, back in the 50s and 60s, everybody that was running was, was running pretty fast. Uh, uh, one stat I, I talked about yesterday was 80% uh, of the field was under three and a half hours in marathons. Really? I think now the average is about 4.30. The average, yes. <laughs> the last place finisher at the Yonkers Marathon in 1963 was four hours flat. Oh, my goodness. Well, I think that's both good. I think it's mostly good. That means the pedestrian runners are encouraged. Yes. And you don't need to run. A five-hour marathon is just as good as running at a four hours, right. in my opinion. That's that's one of the beauties of the sport, is a person running five and a half hours can be just as happy as someone who wins the race. And personally, what, what is your running like nowadays? I run three times a week. I don't race much currently. and. 
but it's uh, my most energized days are after a good run. Love the feeling after a workout. So it's three times a week. I've, I went to that uh, many years ago because uh, to avoid injuries, uh, your body needs rest, uh, and it's. I'd rather do uh, a quality run than what we used to, would call junk miles. So we do the purpose of running. I started doing a 5K or just going recreationally. I said I'm going to do four miles at my own pace. I typically run uh, uh, six to ten miles, mostly 10, 10, 10 milers uh, when I run, uh, and I try to do a little speed work periodically also. Uh, I still would like to do some racing, but I uh, want to get a little fitter before I start look, racing. You look very fit. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the other things about running. Runners, they always want to do a little better, regardless of age. Well, I'm, I'm intrigued with the Masters competition, Masters uh, track. And uh, actually, uh, Sid Howard is uh, receiving a Ted Corbett Award this evening. Okay. The Run to Live uh, organization has a pre-New York City Marathon dinner uh, each year, and they've, uh, they've established a Ted Corbett Award and Sid is uh, getting in. My father's legacy is really is the impact he had on people. And uh, I've, I've had tremendous quotes from people and, and Sid's the same way, you know. Uh, there are plenty of great runners, but you know, hum good human beings, good people are not always uh, Sid abundant. Sid Howard is the epitome of that. And uh, in Master, that's a relatively new field as well. And hopefully, they're digitizing all those records because there's a whole, there's a whole other area yes. of, of rich, of uh, rich heritage right there, you know. And some of those guys came in late in life, you know, but they weren't stars in the 20s and 30s. That's right. Like I said, he came in late. Very late, very, very late. late. And that's uh, that's uh, my father's marathon career started late. He didn't, his first marathon, he was 32. He did his first true. marathon. That's relatively late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you asked about what people can do. Just make contact with me in terms of uh, uh, history preservation history if you're interested. We, yeah. We, we, yeah, start uh, that movement. We really need uh, to find people that really want to work this because okay. it's the, the, the leaders of the sport, it really hasn't bubbled up yet in terms right. of priority. All right, All right. We'll, we'll work on that. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming in. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. Okay.